Here we are, 730 days to flatten the curve. Two years. March 15, 2022. Two years ago today. As good citizens, we wanted to agree with the authorities to flatten the curve. But then the order came down for the church to not meet, not congregate, but to close the doors. That was a Sunday, 15th of March, 2020, two years ago today to the very date. What should we do? We asked among ourselves, what should we do in light of who we are, who we represent? We all opted to collaborate and cooperate not to be defiant, rebellious. But we went live, like I am today, talking to cameras and talking to empty seats like I am today. I don't want to remember those days, but I forced myself to remember to put it in the bank of my memory. I want to emboss it. I want to make sure I don't forget those times that we were locked down. We were shelter in place. What should we do? On that Sunday morning, the 15th, we had the doors open, but we told people, should they want to come, we're not going to prohibit you from coming. But a lot of people were spooked full of phobia and terror and confusion. So only a few people came anyway, and the doors remain open. The following Wednesday on the 20th of March, what should we do? I did not want to be defiant, rebellious in any way, shape, or form. I'm a Christian. I'm a citizen. I want to abide. Then the order came down that we cannot meet at all. And I said to myself, well, that's fine. But I realized that cannabis shop, what's cannabis shop? Weed shop, marijuana shops, uh, marijuana dispensaries were open. Liquor stores were open. Nightclubs were open. All kinds of shady things were open. And yet the Church of Christ couldn't congregate. We gathered together as leaders of our church. And one by one, I asked them pointedly, what do you say remain open? What do you say remain open? What do you say remain open? I did not want to violate the conscience of our pastors, but we all came unanimously agreed that the door should be left open. This was two years ago. I reminded them of what Jesus asked his disciples there in Matthew chapter 16, I believe. There in a place called Caesarea, Philippi, we are told that Jesus went to this place where there is a pagan worship place. And he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And collectively, in plural, but it was Peter that answered. Some people say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others are saying you're Jeremiah or you're one of the prophets because of things that Jesus was doing. But then Jesus comes to that very pregnant, conclusive question, but who do you say that I am? Peter said this. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. You are the Christos. You are the Mashiach. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter was influenced. He was energized by the Spirit of the living God to express and confess 
that truth. And also I say to you, Peter, the word Peter is in the Greek word piedro, which means little rock. Petra is big rock. Petros is a nickname that Jesus gave him. His name is Simon or Cephas, Aramaic. Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah. But Jesus gave him a nickname. Upon you, Petros, upon you, little rock, and on this massive rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I like my version better. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The gates of Hades, the gates of hell, should not conquer it. I know the history of the church in the book of Acts. That's a reliable history of the church. Because history, the church history, is spotted and blemished with all kinds of embarrassing points throughout the centuries. But if you want to look at the perfect church, look no further than the book of Acts. There you see a church that's perfected in the movement, in the government, in the, the influence of the Holy Spirit upon the church. But the church, it seems to me as you look at history, you can look at just the latest history as far as the late 1900s. You see Russia, China, Cuba, Romania, Czechoslovakia, and you can go further. And how many malicious people were trying to squelch and kill and destroy and, and, and destroy and pulverize the church of Jesus Christ? Here we are. Excuse me. Well, I take a, take a hit of my little cafe. The church still standing. There's a scripture in Isaiah 59 that I've been sharing lately. When you look at Isaiah 59, it's very similar to what is happening to our society. In, a, in the Western world, in our own society, maybe not in every city, but definitely here in Los Angeles, California. We know that violence is up. Violence is horribly up. Homelessness is way up. Homelessness, crime is way up. We have a massive invasion, an indonation. Indonesian, Indonesian, in, see, if people were here, they would yell out what I'm trying to say because they know what I'm trying to say. We're overwhelmed, inundation, inundation of illicit drugs coming in just from 110 miles away here in the Mexican border. L.A. is a distribution center, it's a hub, and from here it, it, it distributes, especially fentanyl. It's madness, man. There's crime. There's injustice. There's terror. There's bloodshed. People are angry on the streets. People are angry in the freeways. There, there, there's just a, what I would call a miasma. M-I-A-S-M-A. -S -S Look it up. M-I-A-S-M-A. -S Look it up. Miasma means there's something in the air that affects those who breathe. It's almost like the Italian scientists realized that there was something in the air. They didn't know that the illness was contracted by a mosquito. So they said it's bad air, mal aire. And we call it in anglicized it malaria, mal aire. 
Something's in the air. And something's in the air. We've seen it. Here we are two years later, and we still don't have a conclusiveness what's going on, how to prevent this, this mal- malicious um, disease that is, is ravaging and ravaged apparently for two years. Is the treatment and the prevention worse? I mean, the suicide ideation is up. Drinking and drug abuse, legal drugs and illegal drugs are all-time high. Children lost two years of school. You know what? When I went to Russia and when I went to Cuba, by the way, why am I wearing this hat? Just in case you're wondering, it's a little chilly here. And so I'm bald headed, man. So just bear with me. Nobody's here. I'm just with you and seven people watching this later on. But when I went to Cuba and I went to Russia, I wanted to ask questions from people that lived in that kind of society. And then we realized that every influential institute in that society was taken over by the government. Now, we have influential institutions here in America. We have, for example, the media. We have academia. We have arts and science. We have justice and criminal system the military, entertainment, social media giants like Twitter, Google, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, influential by the millions, millions and millions of people just watching ever and ever unending madness, Hollywood, Madison Avenue, the president, the president administration, Congress, television news. Now, according to Forbes magazine, they said, what is the most influential, reliable institution that Americans still believe today? Small business. Small business. The second one is the military. But look at it now. Look what is taking place. It's a, it's a very sad situation, what is, what is happening with our military. The third most influential, I, I hope you're shocked. I'm not. It should be number one. But the first institution of influence that is not taken and hoodwinked has never had for 2,000 years is the institution of the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, if, you, if you're an archie, you've been studying with us, you, we know that we're going through 1 John. This coming Sunday, Lord willing, we'll finish 1 John chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5, we'll complete it. And, and what is John defending? He is defending the truth of God. He says that we are light in the midst of darkness. The church is light, and we have the truth. And we must defend the truth. We must bear truth like a necklace around. We must stand for truth, walk in truth, propagate the truth, and speak the truth, and defend the truth, because that truth will set us free. I feel like there's a lot of people here today. I feel like I'm not alone. I'm not alone. God is with us, man. God has been with us. God will never rank out. In the last 730 days to flatten the curve, (laughs) here we are. We're still standing. The doors are open. Jesus is coming. Jesus is still changing and transforming lives. 
This is one institution that would not be taken over by a philosophical view. It's not going to be taken by any ideology, any new situation to convey and to, to, to change the church. That would not do. But I tell you what COVID did. It shook us. It shook us. It shook a lot of people. A lot of people for the last two years, people they were walking with God, fellowshipping with God, are no longer doing that. Sunday mornings, Wednesday mornings, Bible reading, praying, absolutely nothing. They're just in la la land somewhere. But it's getting uglier and uglier in our society. What is taking place after 730 days, we see social distortion, we see so societal confusion, polarization, insulation, racial tensions, cultural indifference. We see drug abuse, drug sales, a national mental health crisis, homelessness. This, the people of God have been divided, broken, and shaken. Hundreds and hundreds of churches were closed in the last two years. Pastors quit, they retired, or just experiencing pastoral fatigue. You know, for two years, we have been able to go to the hospitals to pray for people that were dying. They were in the cusp, in the precipice of their death, and we were not allowed to pray with them. What's going on? Not even family members were allowed. To this day, family members still not allowed. That's criminal, man. But nobody says nothing. And here we are. I look at chapter 59, it, it, it blows my mind because Isaiah 59 is divided into three sections. The first section that we see in chapter 59 is verses 1 through 3. Forgive me, 1 through 8. They're the people of God, Israel. God enumerates and indicts them for all their sins, verses 1 through 8. He begins by saying, it's not that my ear is heavy that I cannot hear your prayers. I can hear you. Like the old song, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. It wasn't that Jesus was not listening to them. It wasn't that Jehovah God, Yahweh, was not listening to their petitions. But there was a separation and he said this in verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongues has muttered perversity. And here's the charge. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and they speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquities. And then he gives us illustration of the animal world or the insect world. He said they hatch vipers' eggs and they weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies and from that which is crushed a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works, because their works are works of iniquity, and the acts of violence is in their hand. They, they, their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. In the earlier chapter, in Isaiah 57, verse 23, God says, there is no peace for the wicked. So there God gives us the first part, the sins of Israel. And then the second, the second 
um, the second part is from verse 9 through 15. I'll have you read the third part, the deliverance by God, from verses 16 to 20. But here in verses 9 to 15, we see the consequences of departing from God. What we see here is violence, national violence, lying. Everybody was lying, not just personal lying. Every institution was lying. The priest was lying. The prophet was lying. The royalty were lying. The princes of Israel were lying. The governors were lying. The mayors were lying. Everybody was not telling us the truth. Isn't that what we've been asking for the last 730 days? Just tell us the truth. What is the medication that we should take. Why are we taking medication to prevent this? So we have a mixture of messages. I call it voices and noises. Voices and noises. Whoever wins the narrative wins. But we as Christians, we don't follow any narrative. We follow Jesus Christ. See, Jesus said in John chapter 10, they're my sheep, and my sheep hear my voice, and I know my sheep by name. You as a Christian, God hears us. That's what John says in John chapter 5. We'll study this morning, this Sunday morning. If we know that God hears our petitions and our prayers, and he will answer our prayers according to his will, then we have confidence means boldness. It means courage. The courage, the boldness, and the strength, and the stamina to withstand what's, what comes against us individually, as a church, and as a society, and as a country. What is truth? Truth. Truth was out on the gutters, we are told by Isaiah. There was a lack of integrity. They had no shame. Murder was happening all 24-7. They were shedding innocent blood. There was mass injustice. Truth, righteousness, and justice had fallen on the street gutter. When you read in a moment, there's a very pregnant verse in verse 15 of Isaiah 59. You see, this is where if you... If you have the conviction and persuasion as a Christian, this reminds me. This is a scripture, I believe, in, in Ezekiel, I believe. In Ezekiel chapter, I believe, bear with me. I sniffed a lot of glue when I was a non-Christian. I had too many drugs. Forgive me. By the grace of God, I'm able to remember. Praise God. Yeah, it is. In Ezekiel chapter 9, God sends judgment against his people. And he sent some hitmen from heaven, they're angels, and they had a destructive weapon in their hand. And Ezekiel says, Lord, what is that for? And before God explained to Ezekiel, another angel showed up, and the angel had an inkhorn around his belt, ink horn, and he had a pen. And this angel was to go out into the arena of the public. And the angel will mark those who sigh, S-I-G-H, sigh. What were they sighing? You see, sigh is a, it's an emotional breathing relief. Oh, sometimes it's a sigh of pain. There was wickedness all around them. And only those that realized there was wickedness and they sighed because they were able to do anything, they would just sigh in sadness. And God told that angel, I want you to mark those who see the evil and all they can do is sigh. So the angel went and X them. 
And then here comes the order. Execute everybody who does not have a cross or a mark. Those that had the mark were exempted from death. Ezekiel saw the madness in his vision. You see, in Isaiah 59, specifically in verse 15, there in verse 15 it says this, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. So we read it in context. Here's the consequences. Look at it in the light of what is happening to our nation. Therefore, in verse 9, therefore is the application of the explanation. They left God. They're sinful. They're violent. There's blood in their hands. There's no truth. There's no justice. Therefore, here are the consequences. Number one, justice is far from us. Nor does righteousness overtake us. Listen to this. We look for light, but there is darkness we look for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like a blind man. And we grope as it had no eyes. We stumble in the middle of the noonday as of twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and we moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. We look for salvation, but it is far from us. There you see the soul of a nation. When the soul of a nation leaves and departs from God, the nation damns themselves. Because man thinks he knows the answers. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it brings forth destruction. And that's what we're seeing today. Anyone that departs from evil makes himself pray who even turns from evil. I see the evil. I sigh for our society. I see the evil. And on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, or, in front, or on an empty auditorium, I'm a proclaimer and explainer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not a social commentator, but I see what is taking place in our society right outside our streets. We're only four point and a half miles away from downtown Los Angeles from one of the most homeless problems in the whole United States. That's a sad situation there. Sad situation. We're only four and a half point miles away from the madness. There's so much wickedness in our own community. Isaiah told us in Isaiah chapter 5, something that is taking place even here. He said in chapter 5 of verse 20, a very known scripture. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This was happening today. If we say, that's wrong, this is not right, fake news, listen to the truth, don't read the newspapers, don't read our local newspapers here in L.A., don't read them, stay away from television. But you know what happens today? Today, like many people, us pastors, we looked upon as homegrown terrorists. Think about that. There's, there's, there's a legislation in California to make every pastor shut their mouth against people who are trying to normalize abnormality. We've been vilified. We've been ridiculed. I'm called sometimes a bigot and a racist. I'm called homophobic. Cancer culture is real. If you say anything, you have all these institutions that come against you. See, but you have to understand 
The sin of a nation becomes national, and it brings judgment when it is not restrained by public justice. The problem in Isaiah 59, very simple. The channel of divine communication was closed. Why was it closed? Because the sin was national sin. Now, nationally, everybody was suffering. Human sorrow and despair without God. Human darkness and bewilderment without God. Human shame and contempt without God. You see, now we know the consequences. It took two years for people here in L.A. to realize they're groping in darkness. They're looking for light, and all they find is darkness. They're stumbling in the noon day because there is no directives. There is no guidance. There is no moral government. There is no truth. And when people come to the church... Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 that the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of all truth. Truth with a capital T and has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. This is his church. And the truth will always win. Paul says truth is truth and there's nothing we can do against the truth. And it's the truth. Here we are. 730 days later, back then, two years, one year ago, a year, two years ago today, the same message. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> Nobody here, man. That's all right. Call me crazy. Excuse me. I take another hit. Ah, uh, expensive coffee, man. God bless you, Rollo. Thank you. Hang tight. I'm glad nobody's here. Mm, mm, mm. So we close. Verse 12. There's the admission. For our transgressions have multiplied before you, Lord. And our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against you and departing from you, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is falling on the street, and equity cannot enter, so truth fails. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Beloved friends, we're living in a society, in a culture, that when you stand for righteousness, when you stand for truthfulness of the gospel or the word of God, you're going to make yourself a a prey in your job, at school, in your neighborhood, in your little league baseball, whatever you at, the moment you say something that is righteous, don't expect people to stand and applaud you. They'll probably spit on you because that's the nature of a society. And when the nation has turned nationally against God, they don't know the truth, they live in darkness. They're groping in darkness. The light, they hate to come to the light. There are those who realize they've been in darkness too long. There are those who realize as they're groping and looking for truth. This past Sunday, two services, truth rang out. There were people responding to the truth. You don't believe me? Watch last Sunday. Go, go to YouTube. Go last Sunday, first service and second service, and look at it for yourself. Even before the service began, I just felt that truth had to be expounded and, and fast because people come to the church not for the amenities, 
We have no amenities in our church. We're a humble church here in East Los Angeles. But here's what we do have. We have the truth of God through Jesus Christ. We do have a lot of loving volunteers, that's for sure, expressing the love of Jesus. And then we also have some good food in the food court, always good, good food. That we do have. But the most important thing, we don't grow up in the dark. We are not myrmidons. What's a myrmidon? A myrmidon is like a robot who says yes, 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 and obeys. No, no, we have one master, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and our Savior. Paul the Apostle says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and so are we. We are prisoners of Jesus Christ. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. God bless you. God bless you. This man is going to go on, and I pray God's best upon you. May the Lord be with you. Thank you for your time. Everyone, thank you. Turn around and say hi to one another. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you.